The scientific revolution starts now. I mean, from my point of view, um, particularly with regard to astronomical knowledge, it's pretty clear um, that ancient people, even before the Younger Dryas, uh, were, uh, well, astronomy was important and they were reasonably sophisticated, naked eye astronomers. I think that's, I think the evidence can now pretty well support that, which is not the general view, I don't think, from, from what I've seen. It's interesting what you said about the lack of evidence, because it seems like the stories that we're generally told can only concern evidence. And the strange thing about something that happened 10,000 years ago is that there's probably not a lot of evidence of it in general. And so I, I often, my imagination often goes to this place where what sort of elaborate societies could have existed but not left us anything as well? Like we had uh, Gavin Schmidt from NASA on the show talking about his Silurian hypothesis. I don't know if you're aware of that. But the idea is, you know, he and Adam Frank wrote this paper where they imagined that, say, you know, let's assume that there was a sophisticated civilization. How 20 million years ago. Yeah. How basically how far away in the past would it have needed to have been in order for us to have zero trace of it, like nothing? And they came up with several million years, actually. But the idea still remains that if even a super advanced civilization like ours, which has only been creating artifacts for about three hundred years, maybe maybe you can go back into the Middle Ages and there's metals and stuff, but that would be wiped out very quickly, and. I'm always curious about what evidence we don't have as well. And of course, that's something that very careful academics don't really want to talk about for, I think, for understandable reasons, but it also constrains the imagination a bit. Um, and I think perhaps dulls our access to what's possible. And maybe we can treat this as the entry into the conversation. So we'll treat this as where we, we can start recording from here and start well, it's on the topic. not something I know much about, to be honest. Um, going back that far, I, I wouldn't know, really have much of an opinion on that. Other than to say that I think what paleoanthropologists and uh, I think what we know about the fossil record would suggest that that kind of view is probably wrong because you know, um, modern man, uh, well, Homo sapiens, and then before that, uh, you know, uh, Homo erectus and so on, has only been around, well, I think for less than a million years. So, I, you know, that kind of, I don't think that's really a possibility. Oh, they weren't suggesting that they were human beings. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's well, a so, NASA well, uh, paper, Yeah, this right? is like, the, this the, is Gavin a... Schmidt is the director of the Goddard Space Institute at NASA. And so it's not like a fringe, like, lunatic in his mom's basement. Like, this is a guy who's sitting here and he's thinking about it in terms of the Anthropocene and in terms of the chemical signatures mm -hmm. that we leave and in terms of the narratives that we tell. And he certainly didn't come down on, there definitely was an octopus civilization that we have no trace of. But he did make the point that had there been, we wouldn't know. And that's a pretty unsettling thing to live with because even our window into the past right now is very is is very scant. I think that this is what Shiloh yeah, is driving yeah, yeah. at. Which is that, you know, Gobeki Tepe, which is what we're gonna be talking about, it seems like it was almost an accidental discovery. Yes, I mean and it was, I think, quite unexpected, and it does make you think, well, if, if we can find places like Quebec and Tepe in only the last 20 or 30 years, then what else is out there? Sure. Yeah, just to be clear, I, I don't think Gavin believes that this is the case. I just think that he was making a methodological point that we don't have any way of knowing if it was so or if it wasn't. And there's no reason to believe that it did happen or that there have been sophisticated civilizations in the past. But the 
archaeological record is much worse than we think it is, and the preservation of artifacts is really bad. Like, I, I was just talking with Anastasi before the show. I have a friend who has a ranch down in Sonoma, and uh, he's got all these old cars he's been collecting since, like, the 60s, just parked outside, and they're all just turning into dust, you know? And I, I imagine... How many of these cars is going to be left a thousand? What's going to be left of them, right? Like a puddle of iron oxide, you know? It's like... Well, how, I mean, you've just, I think, provided another reason why that's probably unlikely because I think, you know, we would see the geochemical evidence apart from anything else. Probably, you know, if you go a million years or more into our future, we would be leaving a layer of all sorts of different um, metals and, and chemicals that would probably, a lot of them um, at the basic molecular level would probably persist. Yeah, to, Gavin, to Gavin brings degree. that up. Yeah, he so thinks that they would just look like veins of, yeah, he thinks they would just look like veins of iron or veins of gold or, you know, things like that at, at the million year level, right? But I, I hear what you're saying yeah, about you, a thousand you, years. You don't have to explain. You then have to explain why 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 there are all these um, rather unusual metals that don't often you know there are very uncommon metals that uh, in this fine layer um, you know that we use in our modern technology. So how how would they have come to exist in this discrete layer? So I think that would be quite a, a good signal. Yeah, I think he I think he would agree. I think that was his point is that's what we should be looking for if we go to other planets. Like they're interested in exobiology, right? They're they're space people. So they're they're like what are we going to be looking for as evidence of past civilizations on the mo on different places we visit, you know, ideally as we branch out from our own solar system with robotic drones and so forth. So they're they're trying to come up with techno signatures essentially. Right, I see. Yeah. But it just, you know, it just gets the mind thinking about what evidence would be absent or what would it look like, you know, on Earth as well. Like you said, mineral veins, things like that. And um, I'm not I'm not sure that anyone's really looking at it from that angle. I don't know. So let's go. Let's go to the questions that drive your research and the things that you spend a lot of time thinking about. Shiloh kind of opened a little bit ago where he was like, well, what are the things that you haven't had a chance to really talk about yet? The questions that pop into your head when you're trying to fall asleep at night that you, that you wrestle with. Uh, well, uh, I mean, there is a bit of a gap. Um, so with uh, Tepe, we see, I think quite a clear, signature symbolism particularly and then we see very similar symbolism again uh, when you get down to the late neolithic in mesopotamia and egypt and then into the bronze age so we can see that this symbolism has traveled from or at least we think we can see from the time of um, you know the late paleolithic or the early neolithic through to the late Neolithic or the Bronze Age, <clears throat> uh, but there's a bit of a gap in between where uh, I just don't think anyone's. I I haven't looked in that gap. So from about um, well after Gebetli Tepe, there's another town called uh, Chatelhoyuk, and we can see very similar symbolism at Chatelhoyuk. Um, that's in central Turkey. Um, can you mention some so of that, those symbols as examples? I saw this handbag thing that I want to talk about too, but there's there's a number of them. Maybe we can just give give some there's picture one, to it. Yeah. So um, in the um, sort of late Neolithic, early Bronze Age, there is quite a widespread uh, symbol: the master of animals or the mistress of animals as well. Uh, so this is um, you know a, a human figure um, flanked by a pair of animals that are quite often they're being grasped in two hands. <clears throat> mm. And so that's quite common later on. We've now found something very similar to that at a site called Sheberg, uh, which is just about 10 miles or so from Gebethi Tepe. Um, there's like a lovely wall carving, this scene, where um, there's definitely, or very likely, a, a mistress of animals at Chatelhoyuk. Now Chatelhoyuk is uh, in central Turkey, um, the A for that sort of age range is about 7,100 BC through to about 6,000 BC. 
So we see this master of adult symbol you know, well, near Gebekli Tepe, and then I think the date for that would be in the region of 9 to 8,000 BC. Then we have Chattel Hoyot, and then we have the late Neolithic. So there's this gap from the end of Chattel Hoyot to the late Neolithic of, of about maybe 3,000 years, two to 3,000 years. Um, similarly, we see at um, Gebekli Tepe uh, on pillar 43 in, in enclosure D, at the top of the pillar, we have these, uh, well, you mentioned it, the, the handbags. So we have um, what I interpret to be sunsets, uh, and they're signifying, in my view, um, solstices and equinoxes. Uh, so we see those, and they're next to animal symbols on pillar 43. And then we see those again, um, again, at the late Neolithic uh, in, um, well, across Quite a region, so uh, ancient Iran, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Egypt. This symbol appears. I mean, no, um, from from Sumer, um, from the Sumerians, um, pre-dynastic Sumerians. So in, in the fourth millennium BCE, we know that this symbol is forms part of the proto cuneiform uh, This symbol <coughs> of a basically like a um, semicircle on either a flat or a slightly curved. Um, surface. Uh, so we see that, uh, and we know that in proto form it means um, both the sun and it represents units of time. So you mm. can put different two, different sort of dots or, or lines on this semicircle, and it gives you a different unit of time from you know a day to a week to a month to a year, depending on what kind of little extra uh, indication you have. So we know this, what looks like a sunset. We know it represents the sun and units of time um, in pre-dynastic Sumer, we see a very sim similar symbol on the top of pillar 43 at Quebec Tepe. We see a very similar symbol in ancient Egypt, um, pre-dynastic ancient Egypt and some, on some rock art in the, in the desert. Um, uh, and we see the same symbol on um, artworks from uh, the city of Uruk. So it's quite a common, I said not, not wouldn't say it's common, but it's not, um, it's certainly there in a few, in a few places. Are you aware of the depictions of it in Mesoamerica as well? Uh, I've, I've seen things like that. Um, from what I can see, when, when people talk about that, they have a particular image in mind of um, like a bucket or a mm. pail or something like mm. this. Yeah. So that's not, not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about something which is much more simple than that. It's really just a geometric symbol of... A semicircle on either a flat or a slightly curved line, uh, and um, the buckets I think that you're talking about they are quite a bit later. So I think what what kind of age were you thinking about? Kind of I, I just I saw one on your blog that looked very similar to that. We did a we actually did an episode a, a few weeks ago with a geologist who had been comparing the uh, Egyptian symbolism with this hand basket bucket thing to a couple of stele i believe in mesoamerica and what was really fascinating about it you know on its own you're right it it seems like it's not enough to go on but what was really interesting is that in both cases i believe it was the sumerian statue and the mesoamerican were both being held by these serpent feathered serpent deities um which right. looked strikingly similar and they were both next to this tree it just stretches the mind to imagine that they would have independently arrived on that that image at the same time. Um, and I don't think that the presenter had necessarily an idea of how that happened exactly. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's, not, it. it's not something I've really looked at um, Mesoamerica. I know there are some similarities um, which are intriguing. Um, particularly, I think those those sort of images of deities with the, with the buckets and is it a pine cone or something? Mm. Uh, I think those are much later than Sumer. I think those are much later, maybe sort of mid or early first millennium BC. Whereas I was thinking about these ge more geometric type symbols from, let's say, um, fourth millennium and, and the third millennium BC. So there's a, there's a bit of a gap. There's a bit of a gap, and there's a bit of a difference in style. Now that doesn't mean to say there can't be a connection. I mean, there, there could could actually be, but it's like another jump. It's like another step removed. 
Um, so it's a sort of maybe. <laughs> well, it's a very strange period of time that era, era right before all of these dynastic histories began appearing. There's just this blank spot. It seems like because we have we have some records of these cities, right? Like uh, Gobekli Tepe and maybe even Jericho, or there there seems to be some organized society that's capable of building stone architecture and not much else to go on until we start to get the historic records going uh, in maybe third, fourth millennium. Yeah, I mean, I think... Sorry, go on, Anastasia. Um, I was just going to say, like, what is the... What is the significance for you of a symbol that appears in Gobekli Tepe and then appears again in Sumeria? And then there's this gap in between them. Like, do you, do you, what do you get out of that realization? What I get is that there's an opportunity to do some research uh, to, to fill in that gap because I'm quite sure that there is continuity in this symbolism. And the only reason that there's a gap is that no one's looked. Uh, at this gap, I haven't looked. Um, as far as I know, no one else has looked. So it's an opportunity to do some further research. Uh, and, and I suspect that um, probably these symbols have been seen by others, but they've just been interpreted in a different way, um, simply as, you know, if you're talking about constellations, then they've just been interpreted, interpreted as animals, symbols of animals. Or if you have um, maybe a semicircle on a horizon or on a flat line, it might be interpreted as maybe as an eye or something you know you can interpret these things different way but there is this continuity uh, well i says there should be this continuity if, if we see the symbol in the late neolithic and in the early neolithic then there's this gap of a few thousand years where it should be continuous but uh, i just don't nobody's really looked at it so i think it's just some it's, it's just needs more research um uh, and I suspect we will, we will find this, this symbol cropping up probably has already been found just need someone to put together the, the um and so when you say there's, you know there's, there's, okay. sorry, go on. no 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 go ahead well i was just going to say that there are other symbols as well so um symbols for the sun or circ circular discs we see the circular disc at uh, gebeke tepe we see that uh, at um, chattel hoyuk in in the places where we expect to see it so um uh, we see the circular disc is a symbol for the sun in egypt um so there's that kind of continuity. Um, the crescent moon shape, obviously, you'd expect to see that. That crops up in these different places too. Um, symbols or, or, or myths or um, stories about the, the Pleiades star cluster. So you have seven. Um, so the number seven seems to be important, which often is thought to, re to refer to the Pleiades, perhaps not always, though. Uh, so there, there are there is some continuity. And... Um, it's not just symbolism. There's a lot of um, there, are, there are papers written on um, very very ancient mythology going way back into the Paleolithic, where um, the authors conclude that look some of these myths because they're so because the similarities in these myths are so widely dispersed, some of these myths surely must be you know perhaps forty or fifty thousand years old, uh, where they link a myth to an animal symbol to a constellation. So this seems to be this sort of triangle of links between uh, mythology astronomy and animal symbols seems to go way way back in time uh, right back to the early paleolithic, um, paleolithic. and so it basically Upper seems paleolithic. like it seems like what you're saying is that right now we have a narrative of gobekli tepe and katalhuyuk as being these isolated events in history that happened long before the rise of conventional Mesopotamian civilization. And you're saying that that story has to be incomplete because of the iconography that is transmitted between the two locations. Well, I would say that's that's my hypothesis, yeah. Um, I think it's highly likely um, from, from what we've discovered at Quebec and that uh, it has to be continuous. Well, that's the hypothesis. I mean, I, I in, intuitively, I agree with you. Like, Shiloh and I were having this conversation the other day. We were in the woods and we were thinking about the the way that civilization has developed. So Shiloh was, he, he's, every night before bed, he spends reading Wikipedia articles on the like conventional story of of human history. 
And there is definitely places where there are gaps, right? So you find, you find, like, for example, Sumer. Like, there's this big mystery of, like, how did such a complex civilization emerge from, from you know, the, the in, inchoate brains of hunter-gatherers? And how did they have the, the ability to create this language? And it seems like it came out of nowhere. And I'm like, well, that seems like a story of us not having enough details to be able to fill in where they came from and what their cultural traditions were because it's just such a hard thing to find like every there was just a new city that was discovered in china uh that they started that there was a national geographic article about this did you see this uh, i haven't seen that so basically the, and it's always the same story there's a farmer he's in his field he's like huh there's weird stuff in the in the dirt and he calls somebody and they start digging and they're like my god a huge temple complex, my God, a palace. And so you have these moments where all of a sudden the light shines really brightly onto the fact that, hey, there's an enormous amount of stuff that we haven't discovered yet. And so the narratives that we have right now, which are like, no, 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 this is isolated things where it's just, they're kind of like popping up, I think has to do a lot of with the way that we tell the story of human development as being this thing that happened, A, really recently, and B, B is continuous only to a certain degree. Like it's almost like the story that we have to tell is the story of these attempts and these failures. And then down the line, maybe there's another, there's another attempt, but it's not a complete story of, Hey, there was the younger Dryas. Then there was the establishment of the first cities. And those cities are directly related by genealogy to the later cities. And I wonder, I wonder why that is. Like, what what drives what drives the narrative that they're so isolated and they're so disconnected from one another? So I think uh, in archaeology there is actually a bias that that tries to isolate um, cultures, uh, tries to divide tries to limit the connections. I think there's actually a bias in archaeology for political reasons, quite possibly. Um, so if you, if you go into the history of archaeology, uh, you know, talk about a hundred years ago or more, about not, not, not even that far, far back, you know, there was this difficulty with um, sort of plundering, um, you know, foreign sites and uh, uh, not treating the local people very well. and um, and, and sort of racism essentially and i think archaeology has made a um a, a definite turn a political decision to to try and say look these these cultures to try and give them their own identity essentially to say that they're all individual cultures they're not linked uh, and that's the best political solution um whereas I, I agree with you probably there are many more links than uh, the, the sort of the more accepted narrative would would suggest, uh, but that is not a well received um, idea in archaeology. It's um, this, this idea of diffusionism, especially um, this idea of um, very large scale diffusionism. Okay, you know, very especially very rapid and large scale diffusionism in ancient history. That's really not that's really frowned upon. Uh, because it, it, it sort of is connected with ideas of some kind of super race or something like this. So immediately you've got this political bias against certain narratives, uh, regardless of what the truth is. And I think that's a, a bad idea. So let's talk about the, the arc of, of prehistory. So you have the Pleistocene cold period, and then you have a brief period of warming, and then you have a descent from this momentary climate optimum into the Younger Dryas and out of the Younger Dryas around 13,000 years ago is when you start to see the, the, the reestablishment of some kind of civilization. And my question is, at the very beginning, you said that you don't think that there was anything civilization-like in the Pleistocene. In the Paleolithic, yeah. After so... Paleolithic. Yeah. So how far back? How far back would you say that civiliz that you think that civilization of one form or another can be can be said to have started? 
Well, I mean, my, my hypothesis is that the Younger Dryas impact itself was part of an important trigger for the origin of civilization, and that's all connected with Gebekli Tepe. Um, so, as I say, before Gebekli Tepe, I don't think, or before the Younger Dryas, I don't think there's any strong evidence for what I would call civilization. So, I, I, people will have different um, definitions of what they might call civilization. So, in my view, um, raised the way that I'm thinking about it is that uh, I, I think this is you know, fairly common, but not maybe um, generally accepted. But I, I think of civilization in terms of um, large settled communities. So you, you're hunter gatherer tribes, typically, according to the anthropologists, your your hunter gatherer tribes typically will have a size of maybe a few hundred at most. Uh, at least that's my understanding, um, and then. You know, it, it, but if you get to say the order of a thousand, then perhaps you could say that kind of settled community would then represent civilization. And I don't think at the moment there's any evidence for settled communities of the, of the order of say a thousand people before the Younger Dryas impact. But and so, then, oh, yeah, go and ahead, then go after af, after the impact, uh, well, there's Gebekli Tepe. Now, there's this debate about how old. Well, there's not really a debate, but my I'm suggesting that Gebekli Tepe is somewhat older than um, the archaeologists currently are saying it is. But there are other sites as well in that region that have been discovered in the last uh, you know, sort of half dozen years, places like Karahan Tepe um, and, and, and a few other places. And, and we don't really know quite how old they are yet. So we don't really know to what extent. I mean, you, you mentioned that Gebekli Tepe just sort of suddenly appears in all its grandeur. And, and how did that happen? Well, it's Perhaps possible that there was this period of development of, say, a thousand years from the time of the Younger Dryas impact to Enclosure D at Quebec Tepe, and, and maybe a thousand years is enough to account for that kind of rapid development in architecture, perhaps. Um, so, I mean, th this is a story I think that, that will kind of unfold over the next a few decades as we as we as um, as the archaeologists excavate more of these sites in, in the region of Quebec Tepe. Do you think that that sort of rapid development could have been happening and then cut short by the impact catastrophe? Uh, it's possible. I, I agree that it's possible. Um, it's just I don't know of any evidence of that. Um, so, yeah, I agree. I mean, you, you could think of or you could, you could suggest that um, maybe there was this sort of fledgling civilization, perhaps, you know, with of order a thousand or more people in settled communities, perhaps living on a coast somewhere. And it was perhaps utterly destroyed um, by the cataclysm. That's certainly a possibility. Um, and that, that might help to, to give that sort of development more of a, more continuity. Um, uh, so it's, it's a possibility and, and I'm open to that. It's just, um, I just haven't seen the evidence for it. I mean, the the trick is that you're then left wrestling with the idea of why then, like why why did this happen after the even after the younger Dryas? What was going on during the Ice Age itself? Why didn't anything blossom out of that? I mean, maybe an argument could be made that the climate was not suitable to agriculture and domestication of animals, but. It seems like this relationship with animals goes back much further than the earliest. Even if we start calling Golbekli Tepe a city or a civilization, I think most archaeologists that I've read of in, in these mainstream narratives seem to believe that it was just a convergence point for lots of different tribes or something. It wasn't necessarily a people or a civilization that built it. It's And, and the same goes for Jericho, and, and, and it's kind of a puzzling conclusion, but most people probably don't even think that those constitute civilizations. Um, it's true that we don't know the population size of these places just yet. Um, so, um, you know, you, you, I think Jericho, that, that, that's certainly, I don't know at what point that um, exceeded, let's say this threshold of a thousand people or approached a, th you know, a thousand people settled community. I couldn't give you a, a date for that, but um, you can, you know, I think um, quite late, uh, quite late, is quite it? late. Yeah, I mean, they they believe that the tower and the the large wall there, the, those structures were built 
I, the standard narrative, at least according to Wikipedia, was something like groups of tribes just kind of all came through and worked on it, and it was never a concerted effort by a stratified civilization of any point. And I understand that there probably just isn't evidence for that, and that's why those narratives are the ones that stand out. The, the careful narratives are the ones that stand out, but it also is hard. It's really hard to swallow. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know what date exactly, and what were you, what kind of time were you thinking of? Um, I want to say this is around five thousand BC. For Jericho, yeah, I can look. But I mean, the I guess the more interesting question, maybe the one I was trying to get at originally, was why then? Like, even if we let's mm-hmm. just say that Gobekli Tepe and that era of city building or whatever you want to call it, center. Uh, societal center why then you know why didn't that happen 20,000 years before you know humans like you said have been in their anatomically modern form for a million years why why then uh well i mean homo sapiens um modern homo sapiens i think is two or three hundred thousand years um they keep pushing it back it's there's there's a lot of argument about that but you know uh, so then, but, anyway, taking that forward, there seems to have been another kind of development, at least in terms of uh, if you're thinking about uh, artistic expression. Um, around about forty or fifty thousand years ago, you have the, the, the fantastic cave art. I think you have evidence of musical instruments, mm. uh, perhaps perhaps um, small pieces of jewelry. So, you know, there seems to be, and I think this is this is something that is discussed amongst. Um, Anthropologist is you know, what happened forty or fifty thousand years ago, <clears throat> um, but that, they're still considered to be hunter gatherers. And then you're right. So uh, why why suddenly after let's say the younger Dryas and then um, you know with with Quebec Tepe there and leading on from that, uh, uh, as I say, Chatelhoyuk is seven thousand one hundred, and I think that town is supposed to have a population somewhere between I think four and eight thousand people. So. Clearly, by seven thousand BC, we've got these large towns. Probably, you know, you'll be having other large towns before that as well. Um, so, I, I think, Gebekli Tepe. Maybe the the the, the, the end of Gebekli Tepe. You might be able to say that um, you know civilization has has started. Um, so anyway, so why then? Might what I suggest is that there is uh, well, I mean, the the archaeologists who study Gebekli uh, Tepe, the um, the excavators and and uh, uh, and other anthropologists, they argue that this was a place of um, sort of cult and, and sanctuary, um, basically some perhaps temple or similar similar to some kind of um, idea of a temple, and they so they hypothesise that religion was a key part of it. Um, or at least some some of the uh, archaeologists do. So I think religion, and I would agree with that. I think religion was a very very strong uh, motivating factor for the construction of Quebecly. And I think you know you can then say, well, you have this younger Darius impact. You have the symbolism of Quebecly Tepe, which, in my view, according to our analysis, is referencing the younger Darius impact. And you, know, you have this initial, um, you have this massive amount of effort suddenly going into this architecture. Uh, and this symbolism, probably it's driven by religion. So, I mean, I think the, the sort of standard model of the development of civilization is that it's, it's um, driven by agriculture. And the archaeologists uh, involved with Quebec and Tepe and the sites around there are, are um, sort of attempting to change that narrative. They're saying, well, no, we think because there isn't really much evidence at all of agriculture. Uh, at that time in, the, in those places that we think it was religion. So there was some kind of new religion that, that started this process that brought people together in larger groups. Mm. And then uh, perhaps agriculture developed as a response uh, or as a way to support those larger groups. But the motivation, I think this is what they're saying, the motivation is some kind of new religion. And Given our, uh, the, the the decoding of the symbols, which um, which we think references the younger drive impact, then I think you can s- suggest that perhaps the impact itself generated uh, this new religion. 
some kind of comic cult, you know, if you have this massive cataclysmic uh, um, sort of impact, it's going to be extremely frightening, generate uh, immense awe and fear. Uh, and we know that fear is a very strong motivator, mm. um, organizer of people. So, you know, that, that could be the, one of the key um, stimuli, if you like, for mm. the origin of civilization amongst, but perhaps not the only one, because, you know, if you were to say, well, it was just the impact by itself, I'm pretty sure there have been other cosmic impacts earlier. In, in human history uh, and apparently they didn't lead to civilization so i don't think you can suggest that that's the only factor um but i mean you mentioned the change in climate that's probably got a large role to play um and that would then help agriculture to develop perhaps but what also, was some of that I mean, symbolism just, by the way can you can you just introduce us to some of the impact symbolism that you found <clears throat> so at Quebec, it's happy. um you know, it's, it's formed, uh, I and mean, it was a settlement, it seems now, uh, and there are, it appears there are these sort of smaller house-like dwellings, but the, the, the key parts of Quebec Kitepi that, that really are of interest to me are the, the large rounded enclosures, uh, and, and it's these that are, are, have, are, are suggested to have maybe have some kind of ceremonial function, perhaps as uh, temples. Now, these large enclosures Around the walls are these T-shaped pillars very often. And in fact, in the two oldest enclosures that we know, they're called enclosure C and enclosure D, there are 11 of these T-shaped pillars around the walls in each case. Uh, and at another site, called, uh, as I mentioned, Karahan Tepe, there is this other uh, sort of pool structure which has 11 pillars in it as well. So the number of 11, the number 11 appears to be significant and we can talk about that it's probably related to some kind of um, calendar but anyway the, the key well there are some there are several very important pillars that, that in uh, particularly enclosure d that's the oldest probably the oldest enclosure at uh, quebec that's so far being discovered uh so um <clears throat> there's pillar 43 is the main one sometimes known as the, the vulture stone and uh, so it has Right in the visual center of the pillar, it has a very round circular disc symbol. And on another pillar, pillar 18, we see a round circular disc next to a crescent. So perhaps that means it's the sun. These are the sun and the moon. So a circular disc is, is perhaps the sun. And that would be consistent with other cultures that represent um, the sun as a circular disc for obvious reasons. On the same pillar, pillar 18, um, we have seven little birds at the bottom, and that would fit with, with myths about Pleiades. So immediately we've got this pillar 18, which is suggesting that at least some of the symbol, and perhaps most of it, is of an astronomical nature, the sun and the moon, perhaps the Pleiades. There is a suggestion that, um, I think it's a decent suggestion, that the belt buckle on the front face of pillar 18, there is this belt, belt buckle uh, motif, which looks somewhat like a comet, there's this uh, loincloth symbol down from that, which looks like the tail of a comet. So you, that's obviously speculative. But the key thing is that, you know, um, possibly this is astronomical, especially since we have what looks like a sun and a moon symbol. On pillar 43, we have the same kind of circular disk symbol. Possibly then that's the sun. And now it's positioned relative to these animal symbols. Uh, and you can compare the positions of this disk with these animal symbols with uh, astronomical software like Stellarium uh, using um, representations of the Greek constellations. And there's this very strong correlation. So it looks like this could be a, a map of the sky at a particular instant in time. And there's, then, as I said before, at the top of pillar 43, there are these further animal symbols next to these um, semicircular. Uh, what I regard as sunset symbols, and, and they're pretty much identical to symbols that we know in ancient Sumer did represent the sun and units of time. So you can you can bring that together. You've got lots of evidence pointing towards this being astronomical symbolism. Um, so, so it's almost <laughs> so like the impact is like an organizing principle. It's like a it's as something that everybody has some memory of, some ancestral memory of, and they can 
if somebody can stitch that into a story that is somehow productive to those people then... well particularly you can you can interpret this as a date using procession of the equinoxes mm. um so the, the constellation that's next to the, the disc symbol uh you can take perhaps to be the summer solstice the three other animal symbols next to the potential sunset symbols you can take to be the other solstices and equinoxes and from that using procession of the equinoxes you can derive a date mm. and it just happens that that date uh, if you take the eagle or vulture symbol to be representing um, uh, what we call the teapot asterism of Sagittarius, that date just turns out to be the younger driest impact. And, and um, just to so break then, that down for people really quickly, so the idea is essentially that the pole star changes over time, essentially. And so the constellations are going to be in slightly different places depending on the year. And so if you have the summer solstice being marked in alignment with a different constellation, you can backtrack and figure out where that should have been in the past. Yeah, exactly. So you take the um, position of the sun at the summer solstice, it goes through a cycle of 26,000 years. That's the sort of great cycle. <clears throat> and because it's, that's true for the summer solstice, it's also true for the, the winter solstice and the equinoxes. And so you can actually write a date with an accuracy of a few hundred years in general using the, the four solstices and, uh, and equinox, well, the, the combination of the solstices and equinoxes. You can actually write a date with greater accuracy if you represent the position of the sun relative to, a, to these four constellations. So rather than just writing down the constellation symbols, if you say where the sun is relative to these um, yeah, in the sky on the summer solstice and so on, then you can actually come up with a much more accurate way of writing the date and it appears uh, that that is what has happened on pillar 43 so they've actually got quite a sophisticated way it seems of writing a date mm. uh, using procession of the equinoxes Re more recently there's we have a paper which we've um which is currently in peer review and on the same pillar pillar 43 there are v symbols so just above this eagle or vulture there are these um, sort of rows of V symbols. And in one particular row, you have 14 double Vs, and then a, so that's 28 Vs, and then a 29th uh, at the end of the row. <clears throat> so we can interpret that as perhaps tracking the lunar cycle, because the lunar cycle will have 28 or 29 days. The, the, the length of the lunar cycle is very close to 28 and a half days. So um, you can use this way of representing like, um, 14 times 2 plus 1 at the end can be either 28 or 29, depending on how you, you, um, you sort of read those symbols. So you've got one lunar cycle there. Underneath that, you've got 11 more boxes, and the number of 11 is possibly significant, which then gives you um, something like uh, is it 300 and uh, 60. So 354 days, so we have a total of 12 lunar months. Underneath that, there are 10 more V symbols, so that's now 364 days. Uh, so we want to make up an entire solar year, 365 days, we need one more V symbol, and there just happens to be a V symbol at the neck of this eagle and vulture. Perhaps that's indicating this is another day in the year, which would fit perfectly with, with the theory that it's representing the summer solstice constellation. So it appears that we, we even have a lunar, uh, a lunar solar calendar type of system represented on this pillar, which, and, and it's written in such a way that you, you, know, you can't mistake it. You can quite clearly follow the way that they're counting the days in terms of lunar cycles and then um, the total number of days in the year. And that is, I see that as kind of like a, a checksum. So you're you're writing this date, or you're 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 clarifying that this is a date in two different ways. First of all, in terms of the animal symbols next to this circular disc, and secondly, in terms of these B symbols, which are making it clear that this is um, again it's a date. So it, there's a, there's a lot of information on this pillar, which all works together in my view to. Um, to say that this is a, a date and essentially i think i consider it to be a 
a date stamp of the younger Dryas, probably the younger Dryas in fact. So how far, how much time is between the Younger Dryas impact event and the construction of the pillars? What's the gap there? We don't know exactly um, because we don't really know the age of the pillars. Um, now, the, the date of the impact is 10,835 BC, plus or minus 50 years at a um, uh, level of two sigma. So, you know, 10,835 roughly is the impact. Radiocarbon date for enclosure D is the old, well, there are two, the two oldest radiocarbon dates from Gebekli Tepe at all are both from uh, enclosure D. So there is one of those dates is um, 9,000, I think it's about 9,500 and something. Um, and that is from one section of the wall of enclosure D. Uh, so that radiocarbon date is taken from a charcoal particle that is in the cement of that section of the wall. There's another radiocarbon date, which is exactly the same uh, age, from just outside of the enclosure wall, encl enclosure D. And it's taken from what's described as a half. Uh, near to bedrock level so it's pretty low down and it's exactly the same date so we have two radiocarbon dates that give a date for that enclosure of roughly um nine thousand five hundred and i think it's 30 something so there's a difference there of what is that 1300 years having said that the section of the wall where that date is taken is not the oldest part of enclosure D, according to the, the latest um, papers. So there is, the archaeologists have released this map where it, sh where it shows you know, a sort of sequence of construction for the enclosure. The oldest part of enclosure D has not been radiocarbon dated. And let's remember, enclosure D is probably the, the finest, grandest, largest structure so far discovered at Quebec Tepe. So it's unlikely to have been the very first thing they, they, that they built. And, and at least in my view, I would also suggest that given that it's one of the very first things that was discovered at Quebec Tepe, by pure chance, that's unlikely to be the oldest thing. So I think we can say that the age, the sort of initial, the sort of starting point of Quebec Tepe is unknown. But it's clearly, or well, very likely, to be older than um, nine thousand five hundred and thirty BC. Um, so that's pushing you straight away into the Younger Dryas period, which ended at around that nine thousand six hundred BC. So, in my view, I think the origin of the Bekitepi lies in what's called the Epipaleolithic. So that's the Younger Dryas, essentially. Um, having said that, if you read the, the papers by um, by uh, Professor Clare, who's the, the, the lead archaeologist, uh, he says, despite that evidence, he'll say that the, the age of Quebec Tepe is Neolithic. He says it's clearly Neolithic, or it's very likely to be a Neolithic, but a Paleolithic age can't be ruled out. Well, that's kind of misrepresenting, I think, the, the radiocarbon dates. The radiocarbon dates are telling us the ones that we have, which are not from the oldest part of the enclosure, that the date is uh, probably into the Younger Dryas period. What's the motivation for that interpretation? Sorry, which interpretation? Oh, sorry, that the that it is a Neolithic site. What is it? Just a more conservative take on the evidence? And why is that? Uh, why? I, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I would speculate. So you know, I don't know what they why they said. That this is a Neolithic structure when the evidence is suggesting that it's probably of a younger Dryas age. So, I mean, okay, um, 1300 years between the younger Dryas impact and let's say enclosure D. What do you think is happening in that 1300 year period? Do you have kind of an arc for development in there? Uh, uh, not, I mean, very roughly, uh, all I could, all I could um, suggest is that. That's how long it takes from the impact to get a, a structure with the, the scale and grandeur of enclosure D. That that probably is, but perhaps that's enough time 
after the impact for people to reorganize, come together, and then to, with this new motivation, perhaps of a new religion, to then start. And, and, and the, only, the only difference between what I'm saying and I think what some of the archaeologists are saying, they, they would agree that the motivation of the Tepe is probably a religious one. The only difference is what is that religion? So I'm suggesting that that religion is based on the Younger Dryas impact. Uh, and that, I guess, is what would be considered um, novel or contentious. And what, what, is, what is the consensus explanation for the religious organization, if you were to look in the there, literature? There's, they don't have, um, if, as far as I can take, see, that there is none. Um, it's just left open. Interesting. Okay, so they're basically like, there definitely was a religion, but we're not going to speculate. And so I think that part of this has to do with the fact that the Younger Dryas Impact event is still... It's a theorized event. Well, I mean, uh, theorized, I mean, everything's a theory, right? In well, science, it's true, so. but like you look at you. Okay, so for a long time before the acceptance of the Chicks Club impact, there was the fact that, yes, the dinosaurs were wiped out. Yes, there was something that caused yeah. it. And some people were out in the, you know, in left field being like, it was probably an impact. And it took until they found the, you know, the KT iridium layer for that to become accepted. And so I glanced through your book and you have this presentation on the black mat. And so it seems like that's a very similar level of evidence for the younger Dryas. But then when you start to look into the younger Dryas, people are like, well, it's maybe. Like, is that because Graham Hancock has grabbed onto it and people are just, they want to screw him? Or what's the... Yes, basically. <laughs> Graham, you poor guy. So, yeah, like, tell me a little bit about the, the controversy over the Younger Dryas. Because clearly you come down on the fact that the evidence is, is ample. So there's a layer of uh, platinum that yeah, I mean, is... There's, there's, there's several indicators, uh, and I, I would agree. You know, yeah, I, I've written a review paper on this. But so in my view, um, uh, and, and my review paper has been backed up by a following review paper, which basically agrees with more, more or less. So... Uh, I, for my view, the, the evidence is overwhelming. It's clearly um, a cosmic impact at 10,835, roughly, plus or minus 50 years. Uh, it, it, the nature of the impact is is debated. Uh, you know, it can't, it's very difficult to pin that down. The most likely scenario at the moment is that uh, it was a sort of a widespread distribution of cometary fragments that created multiple, I mean, we're talking potentially hundreds or thousands or more, uh, different impacts over perhaps a, a, a hemisphere of, of the globe. So not that may not be, no, clearly might, it, it clearly is not the, the final answer. There's still work to be done, but that's, I think, the best story at the moment, trying to fit, you know, trying to fit what, what all the evidence is telling us. There is, uh, as what well, there was, I guess it probably still is, going to be some resistance to that idea. Um, but, but if you look at the, uh, if you look at the quality of papers or quality of evidence used by opponents of the theory, it's pretty poor. So you know, basic sort of scientific errors uh, in in the way that they report data. So you know yeah, the way I see it. Now, I, I'm not an expert. I'm, my background in science is not in uh, impact science or um, um, sort of earth sciences. I'm, a, I'm more of a material scientist from that kind of direction. But, um, yeah, so, but as I see it anyway, that the evidence that you have there, you've got sort of a, a layer of platinum, you've got nano diamonds, you've got um, what are considered to be impact microspherals. Um, quite often there are layers of charcoal or very fine uh, soot uh, and this appears to be at a discrete <coughs> layer in the sediment uh, across many continents uh, and so I think the only way that you can reasonably explain that at least to my knowledge is as a, as a cosmic event, uh, impact event so I think the evidence is pretty overwhelming um, a lot of the debate against the impact i think relies on um uh, misconstruing let's say i think the radiocarbon data um so you know as 
I'm sure you're aware that in, in, a, in a radiocarbon data, there can be a lot of error, a lot of um, uh, uncertainty in the precision. Um, uh, and so sometimes you'll see, for instance, that, um, oh, this, this layer in the sediment is not compatible with uh, a younger dry state. But I think in, in those cases, it's a really misunderstanding or misrepresenting or having undue confidence in, in that radiocarbon data. So uh, I think when you look at, or, uh, look at it as a whole, I think it's, it's a really, really strong case, um, overwhelmingly strong in my view, which is why I wrote the paper. How many sites has the black map been discovered in? I, I don't know exactly, actually. Um, of the order of 40 or 50, I think, for the latest count, uh, I, I'd have to go and look at the paper to tell you. What is it? What is this? So the black mat is the the I guess stratigraphic evidence of the Younger Dryas impact event, where there's mm. an elevated level of is it platinum? Uh, so it's a combination of impact signals. Uh, you've got platinum, what are thought to be impact microspherals, um, uh, nano diamonds, and quite often a layer of soot or charcoal. Uh, sometimes it's so fine that uh, it's difficult to, well, you, you can't visually see it, so you get uh, microscopy. Yeah, so this this is in a layer uh, which, according to radiocarbon dating, is consistent with uh, 10,835 on several different continents, mm -hmm. so many of the Americas, mostly Western Europe. Uh, there's one site in, um, in the Levant, so that's Abu Huraira, so one of the world's first villages seems to have been utterly destroyed by one of these impacts. Um, yeah, so there's something like 40 or 50 sites across three or four continents, in South America too. Hmm. I'm really, one of the things about this kind of ancient archaeology that I wish that we had more access to is citizen science. Like, I wish that it was possible for us to do, to, to dig a core in our own backyard and have everybody all over the place be able to do the same thing so that we have a more complete picture because... One of the things that I really struggle with is how uh, point-like the evidence is, right? You have a couple of different sites, but the world is huge. The idea that you make a conclusion off of 50 sites or something, we know how how incomplete that representation is. And so I just, there's not really a question in here. It's more a lament at the 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 realization that the evidence for these things is under our feet, but because it's concentrated in the research projects at universities, it's almost impossible to access it unless you dig a hole. And it's crazy because we dig like we've been digging a lot in the yard because we're installing planters and like built, putting up fences. And as I dig stuff out, I'm like, how is this here? Like this doesn't the the story that we have of our landscape doesn't make sense to me. And it must be the case for longer and deeper stories as well. Yeah, so I mean, you're you're right. It'd be great if we had, you know, much much more data. But I, I think forty or fifty sites on, I think now four continents, is, is pretty convincing evidence. I mean, I don't know how you explain that any other way. So um, now at the moment, that's it covers those sites cover about half of the sort of one hemisphere. Um, we don't know what happened on the other hemisphere. It, it may well be that those sites. Uh, this yeah, this this black map layer is is also there. Uh, I don't think anyone's actually looked. So it's another one of these cases of um, we just don't really know. We can't say for sure yet until we actually look. Yeah. So with the younger Dryas, is the the hypothesis that the climactic event would have been global or local? So the so associated with the impact, there are these other um, sort of signals. There's the there's a climate change, um, so now you don't need necessarily uh, a, a, a cosmic impact cause this sudden drop in, in climate in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so the, the southern hemisphere, uh, the way it, it reacts to this kind of event, um, it's different because of the way that the northern and the southern hemispheres uh, their climates are linked by these immense uh, ocean flows. There is this sort of seesaw effect, um, but anyway. So, in terms of the the dramatic change in climate, that seems to be confined to the northern hemisphere, but maybe not entirely. 
Um, so there's that's one thing. Um, and there's there's a lot of debate. So I mean, the paper that I wrote was was focusing solely on the evidence for an impact. Uh, I didn't go into um, sort of analysis of the research regarding climate change because that's that's just too far out in my experience. Mm -hmm. So there's this there's this um, possible climate signature, the younger Dryas uh, climate shift. There's also associated with this hypothesis, the impact hypothesis, the sort of um, uh, a megafaunal extinction event um, mm. on, on several continents. Again, that's not something I could really speak much about, but that's certainly part of the hypothesis. These are, these are sort of secondary event um, sort of signals, okay? So then the main impact signal would be the geochemistry and if there's any impact craters, and then you'd have sort of secondary effects. Then the climate change would be a secondary effect. Uh, megafaunal extinction event would be a secondary effect. There's also um, suggested to be changes in um, uh, human cultures. So, so we've already talked about one of those. The, uh, perhaps it had a, an influence on the um, origin of civilization in the Fertile Crescent. In America, in North America, um, they talk about the end of the Clovis population uh, or culture, and uh, there was this quite apparently uh, quite a significant change in culture after this impact event. Um, yeah, so there's lots of sort of secondary effects uh, and they are hotly debated. In terms of an impact event, you have to have a crater. Well, not necessarily. No, that's, that's, um, that's one of the features of this uh, hypothesis or the impact uh, is that if you have uh, sort of fragile comet fragments, uh, it depends how large they are. Um, but provided they're not larger than a certain size, and I would estimate, just guessing, that would be a few hundred meters in diameter of that kind of scale, um, then probably what you'll get is uh, an atmospheric air burst. Uh, and so the explosion would happen above the ground, you get this, this downdraft of intensely hot uh, uh, gases, which would then um, potentially... And partially melt some of the surface and uh, vaporize as well, and so you, you have sort of signals from that. So now you like don't necessarily... or something. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So um, it, you know, the, one way that you could think of the younger Dryas is perhaps it was thousands of Tunguska-like events. Now there's also there is a possibility um, that there there were some craters as well, and there are some sort of candidate crater structures um, that are sort of suggested that you know, there might be some craters from. Um, some of these um, impact because if, if you have either a body that's sufficiently dense and compact, uh, then or, or large enough, so it can be sort of more fragile, but it's large enough, then it could reach the ground and, and create a crater. The other part of the, the hypothesis is that it suggested that the impact occurred, or at least the main parts and maybe the largest fragments occurred onto the ice sheets. So you know it's the ice mm -hmm. age. There were large ice sheets at the time, covering quite a fraction of the Earth's surface. So you know it's providing a, if you like, a shield. Um, so you might get some kind of crater into the ice that doesn't necessarily penetrate into the ground beneath. So there are all sorts of ways that you don't necessarily need to have crater for this event to occur. And again, that's another contentious part of the theory because the sort of general thinking, I think, sort of consensus until recently. Is that well? If you've got an, an event of that scale, you must have an, a crater. Um, but I think this this challenge is that. <clears throat> now, having said that, <clears throat> there is this crater structure called the Hiawatha crater that was discovered a few years ago on the northern, the northwest edge of Greenland, and uh, that the age it's, it's very new, newly discovered, uh, and the age is is really quite unknown. Initial sort of chatter, but this is not in any scientific paper, sort of initial sort of rumours or chatter was that this could be, uh, it, was, it was 31 kilometres across, so it's a very large impact structure. Initial chatter was that uh, perhaps this is a candidate structure for the, for the younger Dryas impact. Uh, recent papers, there's been two recent papers that have suggested that's not the case, that in fact the crater is of the order of 50 million years old, 
Um, but frankly, that's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. If you look at the how pristine, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of reasons why that can't be right. But one of the main indicators, I think, is that if you look at the shape of that crater, it looks pristine. It looks like it was made almost yesterday in geological terms. So to suggest that it's uh, 50 million years old, 50 million years under Greenland ice sheets, which would have um, scraped across the surface of Greenland multiple times over many millions of years, there'd be nothing left if it was 50, I mean, really nothing left if it was 50 million years old. The authors of the paper, where they suggest it's 50, 50 million years old, even struggle to, to justify that, that date. They say, you know, that seems to be an extraordinary low rate of um, attrition or uh, for this kind of for this structure that we see, um, and we, we can't explain that. Well, I suggest that probably it's because their date is wrong. Why, why do they come down with such an old date? Well, they analyzed um, some particular rock uh, particles, um, some sort of gravel, and so they estimate you know, that their, their dates on the gravel are probably correct. It's just whether that gravel can be related to directly to the impact structure is, is the question mm. because there are other indicators that suggest that the crater can't possibly be that old so presumably they are they are actually finding the date of something else that may not be the, the crater itself anyway that's kind of a distraction we don't necessarily need to have a crater for the younger dryas impact although clearly if there was one which of the, of the right age that would kind of seal things yeah definitely and the I mean, I think that part of the reason that it's hard to put this together is because there's so there's a relatively narrow group of people that are studying it. And I think that really being able to put ideas together, we have this image of the lone genius who sits upon his throne of ideas and and is like, this is how it happened. And everybody kind of follows along. And you see history that is that is scattered with these sorts of ideas. But I almost feel like there's been a shift in the way that science has to be done, which is that when you're inside of an academic institution, there are and I mentioned this earlier, there's there's conventional stories that are treated as being settled to a degree that it's not worth further interrogation. And having people come in from outside disciplines that haven't been uh, inoculated with this framework is really the only way that you can start to piece things together. Because if you have an extinction, if you have a you know, black line across two continents at 50 sites, if you have this emergence of humans organizing into cities and they have this focus on the stars and they have this, they have the, the, the cultural vagaries that we associate with the development of something that hadn't existed on the earth before, it's hard to, it's hard to not try to find a triggering event. And so if you just have a bunch of places where you know, stuff happened. I don't know. It probably fits together. It's it's really unsatisfying to look into it. And the thing that I really struggle with is that there isn't a continuous story of history. And Shiloh and I spend a lot of time agonizing over this. Like, we'll be in the woods and we'll be trying to piece together, like, how do these cultures relate to one another? How do we relate to them? Is it true that this is the origin of our own traditions? Because if you can draw a line between Gobekli Tepe and then to Mesopotamia, and then from Mesopotamia to everything that's happened in Europe, then what you have is you have a genealogy of civilization that is that exists by, by grace of God, almost, which is that we have not seen a massive cosmological or volcanic event in the space of those 10,000 years that would wipe us off the face of the earth, but it is anomalous because we know that these events happen and so i feel like there's a there's a psychological tension in there where it's hard for us to tell a continuous story because if we tell a continuous story then we have to also tell a really fragile story which is that we exist as we exist now only by virtue that we haven't had an event like this happen Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you're right. So if something like that happened again, if it happened tomorrow, <laughs> that would be the end of our civilization, pretty much. We, we wouldn't survive that. Uh, we would we would be going back to right back to the beginning, probably. So yeah, no, we've been fortunate. Well, 
so fortunate. It, it depends how often these things happen, right? So, and that's another part of the why this is contentious. So, the, the scale of the event that's that's suggested for the younger dryas impact, according to uh, say conventional view of the rate of impacts of different sizes, it should only happen maybe once in a million years, maybe a bit more than that, once every half a million years of that order. But here we have an event which seems to have happened just over 10,000 years ago. And, and so people might say, well, that just seems a bit unlikely, but it's so recent. But of course, if the event triggered civilization, then we're here to talk about it because we're so close to it. So that doesn't necessarily follow. But um, the other thing to say about that is that probably those estimates of frequency of impact events underestimate the true frequency because in the main or exclusively i think they're, they're based on uh, crater forming impacts and so they completely neglect to, to, to consider non-crater forming impacts um and if, if you you know there are there are cometary scientists who whose view is that probably at least i think this is their view that probably the, the the rate of impact has been underestimated quite significantly simply because we failed to take into account these non-crater forming impacts um and the younger dryas impact is, is an example of that one of the one of the so i'm looking right now there's a paper in pnas that was published in in 2012 and what they're saying is that if you look through wetlands that are not associated with the younger dryas event that you find many of the same many of the same markers so it's like the the their abstract is basically saying that you'd find elevated concentrations of iridium you'd find magnetic sediments and magnetic spherules and so they associate that with being a wetland process as opposed to an impact process sure so um, which paper is that so it is the uh pegati yeah um i mean the, the way that you you they didn't perform any detailed analysis of, let's say, the microspheral. So you really have to perform detailed um, surface uh, analysis. So they were unable really to say which of those um, microspherals were impact generated or not. So there's there's a problem with their methodology. Now, the other part of that is that, yes, it is possible that you could have some kind of environmental horizon. And it's possible that um, these signals are there in um, uh, sort of meteoric ablation. So you have this um, cosmic dust, which is settling all the time anyway. Uh, and this cosmic dust can contain um, small parts of you know, nano, nano diamonds and uh, um, uh, cosmic uh, sort of impacts type spherules. So you can get these signals and then flat. Um, problem with that view is that there is the, the signal is far too strong at the younger dryas boundary okay so we're talking about le ele elevated levels that would require a uh, concentration of these of this tiny background rate over a vastly long time so it's not really um it's not really plausible um so if they're thinking that this wetland may have concentrated this background signal by a factor of say a thousand then um it I don't know how they can they can justify that. I mean, so you say that the the microspherules are different for impact versus something that you would find in a wetland. So does your material science background give you insight onto the differences that you would expect? Uh, that's it's kind of going a little bit beyond where I my experience, but um, there are certain features of um, an impact spheral. Okay, it's called a sort of dendritic surface. So when the, the spheral forms from a, an impact event, uh, these spherules are either formed from a liquid or from a vapor. They condense from, from the vapor that's generated. Uh, and so they, are, uh, they, they, they have liquid form and then they cool rapidly as they um, fly through the atmosphere. And as they cool, uh, their surface generates this uh, sort of dendritic, sort of fractured surface. And you can see that quite clearly under a certain type of microscopy. And um, so that's like a, like a, that's one of the signatures of an impact spheral that you wouldn't see in an ordinary type of, a normal type of spheral that you see. Um, so there's that, but it's also the, the element as well. So if you, if you analyze the, the chemistry 
of so the, the, the atomic makeup, the chemical makeup of your spheral, uh, typically you'll find that it's some combination of the impactor and the surface in some kind of uh, fraction. Um, and so, uh, so if you find that sort of elevated levels of certain elements, then that would suggest that that's an impact spiral rather than just an ordinary terrestrial yes. spiral. So my, anyway, I think the, the key from that paper, the Bugatti paper, is that he didn't do this, this sort of surface texturing analysis using very detailed microscopy. Um, so they, they can't really say whether the spirals they found are impact related or not. That makes sense. Um, how did how did you get interested in this question? Uh, which question, sorry? The, 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 the question of the younger the, Dryas and the birth of civilization, because your background is in material science, and uh, what's, the, what's the direct line between material science and this, and this time? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is uh, it's not my day job. Um, so I am a chemical physicist, more or less. I teach chemical engineering. So my research is at the interface of chemical physics, physical chemistry, and chemical engineering, uh, and somewhat to do with material science as well. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, uh, it's just just an interest um, discovering. I heard about Rebecca Tepe. I wanted to find out more about it because it seemed very um, uh, interesting, very unusual. Lots of unanswered questions, uh, and so that took me into Rebecca Tepe. We then, um, through reading a book of Graham Hancock's, we had this initial uh, in his book is the, the sort of the insight, key piece of information, uh, which then allowed me to decode very quickly the rest of the pillar and other pillars. Uh, and that's kind of where it all started. So that's how, that's, uh, how I got into all the archaeology, into the, the impact science, the younger Dryas, uh, and everything else. Do you, do you bring your, your chemical physics background to bear on the investigations? Well, I mean, to, to a small degree, I would say. Um, so in, in uh, decoding pillar 43, um, we have developed a statistical um, method or test for the correlation on the pillar. So there are these there there's this sort of correlation between the animal symbols and um, the uh, the constellations in, in sort of modern software. And and if you look at the animal symbols and the constellations, it's fairly clear. But we've tried to develop a statistical way of measuring that correlation and that involved some sort of quite simple statistical sort of analysis which is vaguely related to my what I do in my day job. So my day job in chemical physics uh, one of the things we would do is um, estimate or calculate things called partition functions doesn't matter what they are but the point is that they they integrate or they sum over different orientations of particles, molecules uh, in, in space. So you, you know, we have this way of counting or, or, or summing over or integrating um, different configurations of objects. So that's part of my background, and that is quite useful for analyzing uh, the information on pillar 43. In the sense of likelihood of, uh, you know, the, the odds that it's coincidental? Yeah, exactly. So uh, in, in terms of the correlation, so the correlation between um, if our hypothesis is correct, what we expect to see, and the correlation between that and what's on the pillar. Um, I, I saw, and, okay. and, and so we come, up, we, come up with, we come up with this statistical test in a very, very high significance statistically. So you have this very, very strong correlation, at least according to our, our view of the, the statistics. And then along with that, you have these other symbols, which are also telling you that this could be, or is likely to be astronomical. So as I said, you've got these, these handbags, or sunset shapes, which you know in uh, SUMA actually represent the sun and represent units of time, or different units of time. So you know, that is a really strong indicator. We've got this circular disc, which on another pillar is next to a crescent moon symbol. Another strong indicator that this is some kind of astronomical <clears throat> signal. We've got the V-shapes, which we can count up as a lunar solar calendar. And again, it agrees perfectly with our view of what these animal shapes are, are saying. So we've got lots of different ways 
all pointing to this is some kind of astronomical symbolism. You then kind of factor that in to this extremely strong correlation between uh, RQ astronomical sort of, um, sort of uh, astronomical software and what's on the pillar. And I think you have a really, really strong case. So I I looked at some of the figures in the book and the the drawings of the constellations are pretty they're they're stick figurey, right? So you have yeah. these these rough shapes and what you do is you map these kind of rough stick figure shapes onto the more complex animal shapes that are on the pillar. And so yeah. how do you is there is there some test that you that you have put together to justify that the animal shapes are the stick figure shapes because i mean like you look at you squint and you're like yeah they do look similar but they could also just be the animals that are living around there uh well it's possible but um that would explain far less of the information that, that we see so you know the whole point of science is that you are trying to explain observations you have the, the, the smallest amount of input data that gives you the largest amount of output for your model so model efficiency occam's razor mm. i'm really interested so in that and that animal side of things too we kind of like skipped over that but it seems like you've made a case for a religion organizing these civilizations but there's also this it almost seems like from my mind goes to domestication of animals right that these were perhaps pastoral tribes and that they had some long far predating civilization relationship with animals that was very uh, sophisticated. And I wonder if you think that plays into the birth of civilization as much as something that we hear more about, like agriculture or something like that. Well, I mean, the way I see it is that, I mean, there could be some kind of relationship like that. But again, I think I mentioned this earlier on, we, we have a view of um, very ancient mythology, some of the, the most persistent um, mythological tales across the world are related to animals and constellations. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the conclusions of several uh, pieces of work, several research papers on these very ancient, very widely dispersed mythologies. So you've got a link between animals, constellations, <clears throat> and myth. Then you've got Paleolithic cave art in Europe, where you have, again, you've got these animal symbols or paintings of animals, very similar um, form over, or very similar style over, say, 30,000 years. So that would suggest that there is some kind of cultural continuity there, because different cultures have different artistic styles. If you go to a different part of the world, it's a different artistic style. There is this continuity in artistic style in European Paleolithic cave art, which lasts for about 30,000 years. So how is that possible? Well, if it's linked with a mythology, that might help. So again, you've got animals. Or, or utility, things. too. Like, what is the animal that everybody seems to be obsessed with? It seems to be the bull. And you think, like, that's a weird animal to be obsessed with. Like, that's not one you're hunting in the woods, necessarily. But it is one that's capable of dragging big blocks of things around, right? It is one that's yeah, capable well, of doing a lot of work for you. That provides a lot of meat as well, I expect, yeah. So there's that. There could be a utility aspect to it, um, but another thing is that, um, as I was saying, so we've got um, we've got myth. You have these um, ancient paintings in the caves. In order to to justify that continuity, probably they're linked, or possibly they're linked with some kind of mythology, and that would fit with what we know about the mythology or, or what we think. The evidence of some of these very ancient myths. So possibly these animal symbols in the caves are linked with myths and therefore astronomy. So that's another indicator. And then you come forward after the Bethlehem Tepe, you come to um, ancient um, Mesopotamian civilizations. We know that their myths, again, are linked with animal symbols and constellations. So we know that from Mesopotamia. We see in ancient Egypt that we have animal symbols. We know that they're very interested in astronomy and myth or religion. So we see this kind of connection between the animal symbols, myth and religion in many places, or there are, there are 
there's evidence for it, let's say. Um, so I'm suggesting that it's something similar at Quebec and Tempe, and that there is this continuity from Paleolithic time through two places like Quebec and Tempe. I'm not suggesting that's the only place. Right, but it seems like the myths have to be there. Like myths well, happen. The, for, the, for... Bull, the bull was a was a common was was a wild animal. It was the the auroch before they were domesticated, and so it makes sense that if it was a food source, and the I'm looking at this the the spread, and the spread is basically f- through the UK down into northern Africa, through Mesopotamia, through like all of the 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 middle step countries down into India and out to northern China. And so this is an animal that was present in the wild before it was domesticated extensively. And so it makes sense that if it was basically a walking food source and a labor supply. But some of the most ancient civilizations like in India, right, they don't eat the bull. They're re- they're, we don't it's know like a if god they ate the they, bull at that point or not. I mean... Their persistent religions like revere the bull still, well, so, and but they don't so the it. the crazy thing is that the the bull declined, and so and they they think that it's likely that it declined due to hunting and due to human pressures, and so it's possible that you have a culture that reveres the bull because it was a once abundant food source that now is gone and is the symbol for what the civilization once was. But I guess what I'm just trying to say is that. The bull as a present feature across all of these cultures and represented in art makes sense given its distribution. As like a supreme order giving deity though, I mean, I'm also just like, have you seen some of these, like, have you seen the like 40,000 year old cart tracks and things like that? Like the, just the evidence of sled, sleds from, from a long time ago. It, it just seems like to me, like if you're going to do hard physical label, it, like, look, Gobekli Tepe is built out of rocks. Sure, you can pick up the rocks and carry them around, but it seems like the first thing that I would think of is to strap the rock to an animal and have the animal drag it around for me instead. And if I figured out how to do that, that would probably give me some social currency to gather people around me and do more of it. And I just don't see a lot of discussion of that, that... you know, beast of burden idea that's not part of the agricultural picture. I, I don't know yeah. if that, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure they ate them too, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how Rebecca Tepic was constructed, whether they used animals you know, to, to pull the, the stones or, or not. I mean, um, if, if the animals aren't domesticated by that time, um, I think it'd be quite hard to um, sufficiently tame uh, a big beast like that. But who knows? Presumably, they were herding them around. I guess probably before they domest- domesticated them into. Well, yeah, there, there would have been a long process. Yeah, that, that led to the genetic changes that, that they see in the in the archaeological record for sure. They actually so the uh, the Oruk genome suggests that they domesticated them ten thousand five hundred years ago, and so then beasts of burden that are central to your ability to get stuff done, right? Because like, if you think about the way that our art idolizes electronics now, you know, the, the machine, the machine intelligence, the emergence of this, of this super being from silicon chips, it makes perfect sense that for a civilization that depended on a specific animal that was pr- relatively prevalent on the landscape that they figured out how to have a productive relationship with, that it would show up basically everywhere throughout their artistic practice. And until the animal declines, you don't see a disappearance of it in the art forms. Yes, but would you deify that animal? I think so, because it's like, think of think of the... Like, think of Soviet propaganda posters about the space race. Like, there's this really amazing uh, cartoon. I, I, it's not quite a cartoon. It's kind of like a painting. It's this astronaut floating in space. And he's got, uh, he's like looking out across the landscape. And underneath it says, I don't see any God here. 
And it's like the deification of the technology that allows us to accomplish the things that we accomplish is pretty prevalent. And so if I was living in a, in a society where cattle were, were basically the foodstuff, they were the the power that moved society. They were everything that they were. They allowed us to survive. They you know? represent strength. I mean, it's hard. I, I don't think people understand how close our own modern Judeo Christian traditions are to cattle worship. Like <laughs> really, like the the right, Canaanite on on the Canaanite re, the the supreme deities of the Canaanite religion that gave us the Hebrew tradition were essentially bull worshiping. They were bull deities essentially. And so we're we're still on that path. It it's it can't be overstated how important the bull was. And I don't know. Yeah, obviously you can eat it, but there seems to be more to it than that. Well, and how important animals were too. Like I think that we live in a particularly strange time in history right now where animals are so far on the margin. Like I don't know where you live, but how often do you see wild animals? My days probably. <laughs> <laughs> sure, but like what, like squirrels and stuff, or or wolves oh, not, and not, not, bears. Not, not, not the big beasts. No, 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 nothing like that. Right, and so there's there's a time when people are living on the landscape in a way that they haven't pushed the edges of nature away yet. And when you look at the cave paintings, you see a time in human history where nature is integrated into the existence, and so you're representing the things that are the focus of the society. And if you haven't developed agriculture yet, you're going to depend on animals. Like people talk a lot about, you know, the the ancestral diet of like wheat and potatoes and stuff like that. And sure, even the Vikings grew wheat. But that's so recent. Like there was a time period where the there were gigantic animals on the landscape and humans around to eat them. And that's what you depended on. Like Lewis and Clark, when they came through the Western United States... They passed. They were looking for the fabled Northwest Passage, right? They were looking for a river that went from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Obviously, there wasn't one, but they ended up on the Columbia, which is the largest river on the West Coast. It has this enormous drainage basin. It's, it's very old. Lots of cultures developed around it. Also, generally after the Younger Dryas Impact event, which I'm sure is not coincidental, but they were passing through these villages and the diet consisted of like a pound and a half of salmon per person per day. And yeah, they had some other stuff like they ate the camas lily and the, you can make food from acorns and stuff like that. But your civilization, the, 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 the well-being meat of your civilization depends on meat. But that's what's so strange to me is some of these people were eating, they had access to woolly mammoths. Like why would you eat bull if you could eat a woolly mammoth? When did the woolly mammoths go extinct? Not that long ago. I mean, the 40,000, like some of these Auric cave paintings definitely coincide with woolly mammoths. Woolly mammoth is hard. It's hard, but you could eat it for a long time, right? If you have enough salt to preserve it. Like yeah. that's, that's the problem too. It's like I, you have to have an herds animal. Of giant, like which one are you going to pick? I'm just saying. And it'd be harder to, it would much be, I would argue that it would be much harder to domesticate a woolly mammoth to drag your rocks around than it would a bull. Sure. Right, because they're on the order of the size scale. You can tie them up and stuff. Good luck tying up a woolly mammoth. But you could eat it. You could kill it and eat it. I mean, I think, um, I mean, what you're saying is all perfectly reasonable. That could be an explanation for um, animal symbols. Um, but the issue here is that might explain the presence of animal symbols, but it might not explain the details of why that animal in that position and that animal symbol in this position uh, and, and why this spherical object or, or, or circular disc object with this crescent of moon like object so it's the totality of symbolism and we're trying to explain of as much of it as we can including the the relationship between positions and the shapes of these animal symbols so we see at Quebec on pillar 43 a really strong correlation between the animal symbols that we would expect for this hypothesis and constellations that in um, this particular software. So how, that's that's one. Well, that that was their data. TV, right? Like that's what they they didn't have, you know, Netflix, right? So they would they would obviously have the sky above them in all its glory, which we kind of miss out on under these modern lights and the stories well, that. 
the stories of their lives must be what are encoded in these myths essentially like myths aren't just fairy tales right they they contain vital knowledge i would argue for perpetuating a tradition like perpetuating a society well i mean so i mean you've argued the case there for um these are just potentially just animals just just being animals but if you think about people hunter gatherers you know, if, if they wanted to improve their lives, they would do well to, to study, as you just said, they would do well to study the sky. You have the sun, which regulates the seasons, and all of their resources are seasonal, um, away from the, the equator. So, you know, everything is really strongly dependent on the season. So it makes sense to track seasonal changes, and it once you realize it, then the sun is clearly um, driving that process. So you, it, it's absolutely completely natural to take an interest in the sun and its changes through the year. Once you do that, you'll see that um, it sets at different positions on the horizon. And once you notice that, you can then start, you'll then define solstices and the equinoxes. Once you've done that, you've defined true north. Uh, and then you might be interested in uh, sort of keeping track of that in some way. And, and the way that you can do that is to say, well, what are the stars like behind? No, we, can, we know that the sun's going to rise at a particular time because there's this particular pattern in the stars that precedes it. So you then start taking notice, perhaps, of the stars. And, th- and I'm saying this is a completely natural thing for ancient people to do. Of course, um, yeah. It's very technological, but it makes sense that their cosmology was integrated in such a way that the stories they told on the night sky would play into a cosmic picture that was technologically relevant. Like, it was real to them. Like, their science and their myth weren't separated, in other words. They had a, a picture of the world that was completely integrated. The sky told the stories that happened on Earth, but it also informed what would happen when to plant crops, maybe the menstrual cycle, all of these things, right? They were just, there was no separation for these people. I also think that the technology of paying attention to the equinoxes, where the sun sets, where the moon rises, how the seasons pass, how the year works, is instrumental to your ability to even do animal husbandry. Right, because I think that we we have this tendency of looking at animals as like I, I don't I don't know they kind of do their they they just they breed whatever, but you as someone who is trying to domesticate animals as somebody who needs to have a group of animals that you're going to be maintaining for either food or burden you have to be able to say that hey at this time of year we have to move them from here to here in order for us to be able to get the best possible population for the next season and, and so the it's fertility like, cycles too yeah, and yeah 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 right. definitely. so if you're, if you're planning your family life or your and your tribal life, then you're going to want to keep track of time. And the way to do that, the best way would be through tracking the sun. Also, it, it can help with navigation, um, navigation using the stars. So once you start defining, noticing these constellations, you then need some way to, to group them into recognizable patterns. And so I think it's completely natural that ancient people would define uh, constellations and then how would you define the constellations? How do you represent them? I mean, choosing animals would be a, a natural choice. It doesn't have to be that way, but it would be a natural choice. And um, it's like really important to remember that nobody thought that the stars and planets were stars or planets for most of human history. Like it was a foregone conclusion that they were something supernatural essentially it it was just a given because they didn't have i mean the first greek philosophers who argued for a material basis of stars were laughed out of the room if not threatened under pain of death right that was that was so antithetical to the organizing principle of those civilizations that those were dangerous ideas and so it's not like they had this separate idea of the stars being you know natural pr- or you know earthly material processes that are playing out and you can clock things by them they were just like no this is obviously instruction from the gods telling us when to plant our crops and 
And it also makes sense that you would treat animals as gods too, because you look at the human condition, and we're basically naked worms on the landscape that have babies that have to be taken care of for years before they can walk and they can function and they're independent of the mother's body. And then you look at an animal, you look at a bear cub, and it pops out and it's walking. And you have to look at it and be like, well, clearly these are more advanced creatures than us. They seem totally fine. Like they, they just, they live and they exist and they operate. And here we are struggling to feed ourselves. So clearly they're the divine ones that have figured out the ways of nature. And we simply pray at the altar of these creatures to, to hope that we survive the next terrible passage. There are also some other... <clears throat> Good indicators that um, these Paleolithic animal symbols relate to astronomy. Um, so there, there is a, a French archaeologist whose name I can't pronounce, unfortunately, but she has done a study of the direction that these painted caves, particularly painted caves, these the caves with painted animal symbols, the direction of those cave entrances, and they appear to be quite strongly correlated with the directions of the setting sun on the solstices and equinoxes. Mm. Um, and and a, I mean, it's difficult to check her calculations because it hasn't been published in a, in a well-reviewed uh, peer-reviewed journal, but um, other archaeologists have checked her calculations and they suggest that this is a significant correlation that should be taken into account. Uh, and I've done another study where we, um, based on our deductions from Gebekli Tepe and one or two other places, we generated a hypothetical ancient zodiac. And then we compared the radiocarbon ages of these animal paintings, that, or basically all of these um, radiocarbon dates for these animal paintings in the uh, English language peer-reviewed literature, compared that to what we expect based on our hypothetical ancient zodiac, uh, assuming that people were painting that, that specific animal when that constellation was um, the summer solstice constellation or the winter solstice constellation and so on. And there is an extremely, str I mean, an extremely strong correlation um, between what we'd expect if these were paintings of zodiacal constellations uh, and the radio carbon dates so it's a very strong correlation and that kind of ties in with this notion of the, the orientation of the, the cave entrances as an example probably the most famous cave of all is lasco i mean i'm sure you've heard of lasco so the orientation of the cave entrance lasco cave entrance is very close to the setting sun on the summer solstice in other words um, as the sun approaches the summer solstice day by day, its setting point uh, gets more and more northerly, uh, and then it'll go. At a, once it goes past the summer solstice, that point will start tracking back south again. So there's like a northern limit to where the sun sets on the summer solstice, and that is the direction of the cave, uh, pretty very closely the direction of the Lasco Cave entrance. So what would happen then is that on the summer solstice, or perhaps within a few days of the summer solstice, the sun would be able to shine into that cave directly. Uh, on any other day in the year, it wouldn't. And what it does is that on the summer solstice, or perhaps a few days around then, it would shine onto animal paintings in that entranceway. And according to our hypothetical zodiac, it's shining onto the, const the animal symbol that represents the um, summer solstice constellation at that time, which happens to be the bull, uh, which we think represents Capricornus at that time. So there is this extremely strong correlation in that we can measure between the dates that these symbols are painted and what we expect based on our hypothetical zodiac. And that ties in very well with this apparently strong correlation in the direction of the, um, the cave entrances for these painted caves. And that is all based on a hypothetical zodiac that is deduced from Gebet and Tepe and one or two other places. So I think this is, you know, this is further evidence that there is this link probably between 
animal symbols, constellations, and myth. But it's very, very ancient and has continued right down through to, well, uh, certainly the Bronze Age. Uh, yeah. What is the, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, what's the date of the Lascaux Caves? Do we know? I'm looking right now. So um, the Lascaux Caves are thought to be painted. Um, those ones don't have radiocarbon dates, but based on archaeological evidence, the date for them is around about 15,000 uh, BC. Wikipedia says 17,000 years. So 17,000 years is before is, is well before your before. date for Gobekli Tepe, though. So that's 17,000 years before today, so that's 15,000 ah, BC. Ah, of course, of course, of course. So that's, that's about, um, yes, that's about 4,000 years before um, the Younger Dryas impact, uh, and therefore, what, 5,000 years before Quebec Tepe. Well, we don't know how old Quebec Tepe is, but 5,000 years before the um, enclosure deep. So. I see. I mean, what's strange to me is that these astronomical apparitions and the tracking of them could be so old, and then it took an impact or something, like, it's just so strange that you have the centralized convergence on them as an organizing principle if it's been around for so very, very long. Like if I think it's in some sense it sort of depresses me because I realize that today we are completely out of touch with what's happening in the night sky. Because but if you go back before electricity and you're you're pretty much that's that's pegged to everything that's happening in your life all day every day it's the most ever present realization and the fact that well, these peoples okay. from all over the world are converging on similar stories you know i think there's aboriginal australian stories of this bull in the sky that are like 40,000 years old like really but total like no contact with other peoples right they're also just converging i, I believe they're just converging on a similar narrative in the sky because it's playing out and they also you know prize these animals and for whatever reason but it's so bizarre to me that that you wouldn't be able to organize a civilization around that earlier mm. yeah i guess it depends how you define what well, civilization you'd need to then find <clears throat> a culture yeah i would agree that there's, there's some kind of cultural continuity what there appears to be. Um, is that a civilization? Uh, or, in my view, I think you'd need a large settlement. Yeah, it seems like building these stone cities really is what we're talking about. I mean, I don't know if it's fair to call them cities, but stone uh, stone works, right? These, these, I don't know what else to call them, towns or... S settlements. S settlements, thank you. Yeah, so, and that that's what's really unique and interesting that happens you know and we well, let's just we'll call it civilization i know that's not appropriate but this moment that happens after the younger dryas that is still such a mystery to me what catalyzed that change and that's why i like tend towards this domestication of animals argument just because i feel like moving large bricks around is not a fun idea if you're a cave person like it's the last thing you're, they, well, they probably lived in caves for a reason because they're already built right you don't have to drag huge piles of rocks around and i, I wonder if the dr the ability the newfound technology of dragging these rocks around had something to do with it but why like why did that appear all of a sudden it's just so bizarre Yeah, uh, I mean, like I say, I, my view is that there is, it is this combination of factors. Um, the impact, climate change, and uh, te the technology readiness level already. So <clears throat> you know, um, technology changes exponentially, slowly or quickly, how you want to say it. But it, there's this very long period where very little happens and then I mean, we see it today, you know, changes are so quick, uh, seem to be accelerating exponentially all the time. So, you know, it, we can hypothesize it's the same back then. That at a certain point, you reach a part on that curve, um, combined with this extra motivation, this new religion, combined with suddenly there are these new areas of landscape that you can move into that are fertile, that you can make use of. So, you know, perhaps it's a combination of things. and. 
to try and settle on one explanation alone, I suspect you're always going to be lacking something. You could say, well, that's part of it, but if, if that's if that's the only explanation, then why did it not happen further back then? You know, I think this combination of factors all came together at that point. That's what I would suspect. And I guess that's what makes predicting the future essentially impossible because these the step function of technological increase is anyone's guess essentially right it's this it's our ability to just plug along using the same old means for thousands of years before something radical happens and it's it's hard to say what that is you know looking back a thousand years from now will somebody be able to point at one thing that led us to invent the internet and artificial intelligence will they will, it, will there be one thing will they point to climate change or religion or global trade or what you know what will they pin that on i wonder but yeah, yeah it's, it's a very it's, it's a massively complex system isn't it so uh <laughs> and that's a combination that's what that's what we love about nature it is a massively interconnected and bewildering system hey do you think that it's significant that there's not human remains at Go gobekli tepe i think um more recent excavations have found some remains. Uh, yeah, so for a long time, um, it was wondered why they hadn't found any any human remains. But uh, I think they have more recently. Um, I think that they they found some like bone fragments, and they seem to they they it looks like they found some skull fragments as well, where they're like maybe it was a cult of skulls because they're like modified in a strange way. Yeah, so that there are those there are some skull fragments with sort of some incisions on them but that suggests that people were doing something with the skull um i think they have actually found some burials um and this is part of the evidence that's led them to, to think that this is a you know a settlement apart from everything else that you know them people were uh, living here and, and buried here uh, sort of under the floor like they see in other settlements in turkey nearby that um, you have this this house in the community and after a while um, you, you want to build a new house, and so what you do is you partially demolish the old house, and your relatives are sort of buried under the floor. So I think uh, I think they have found uh, some uh, more than just skull fragments, let's say, some burials. I think. Okay. And and what's really weird is they seem to have destroyed the somebody destroyed the place or filled it in. Like it seems like there was a concerted effort to leave at some point. Yeah, so again, um, sort of one of the initial ideas was that uh, perhaps it was buried intentionally as a way to preserve the site in, in a similar fashion to when um, uh, there's evidence from other sites that uh, at the end of the lifetime of a house, they would partially demolish it and build on top of it or, or bury the previous house. So there was this idea that, well, maybe they did that to the whole site. They buried it intentionally as a way to say, well, that's the end of that site. Um, but I don't know, I think the, the latest idea is that there's, again, it's more complicated than that. So possibly there was some kind of inf natural infilling. Um, so I think the idea is that you have these large enclosures and around them, the houses get built up layer upon layer or house upon house over time until they are quite high. And all of this is on a slope anyway. And so perhaps you could have a storm or an earthquake and you just get some insliding of the material um, into the large enclosures uh, and so then it's a case of well, do we abandon that closure do we then fill it in completely or do we just let that happen naturally or do we sort of try and sort of dig it out and use it again so i, I don't i think the latest idea is that it may not entirely have been intentionally built mm. yeah there is this like wider pattern of people just occasionally leaving cities uh, I mean, I'm I'm thinking of the Bronze Age collapse in particular, but it seems like at some points cities become an unfun place to be, and people tend to not want to be there anymore, so they leave. And it might not take. Yeah, a, that, I mean, there's a natural life cycle, isn't there, to a, a settlement? It, it, I guess, what happens is another settlement nearby um, starts to sort of suck the life out of its neighbouring ones, and and they sort of reduce. 
So, yeah, I mean, you could think of, I mean, you mentioned Jericho, perhaps it became so popular that it started attracting people away from places like Quebec totally, or, or other places, you know, it's a sort of dynamic evolution of settlements. Mm. And at some point, I guess, there's not a large enough population to support um, the, the sort of, and maybe the original reason for being there is, is kind of lost or forgotten. Mm. Yeah, I, that's that's another curiosity too. I'm I'm always dissatisfied with what I read about the reason for being there, which seems like it's just a crossroads where people will just happen to occasionally meet. Well, Quebec Tepe is on top of quite a reasonable hill. It has a fantastic view of the landscape, particularly to the south. Um, so it, yeah, it's an ideal place for looking at the stars. Uh, what's the sorry. cultural con? What's the cultural context? of the settlements around Go uh, Gobekli Tepe? Yeah, so uh, recently, the last few years, there have been a number of other sites uh, in, with what appear to be T-shaped pillars like Gobekli Tepe that have been found in that sort of local area with a sort of radius of, say, 40 or 50 miles. And so there is now an archaeological project um, that goes under the name of the Tash de Pella project, uh, which is the aim of excavating these these sites. And so, yeah, it, I think it, the view is that these are probably one related culture. Maybe the sites have a, a little bit of their own style, but these are like a one related culture. And so they're, you know, like like the ancient Egyptians, you, you know, they're trying to excavate uh, as much as they can of these apparently related sites. What, what did you say the name of that project was? Tash Tepela, so T A S, uh, and then Tepela, T E P E L E R. Tash Tepela. So it's a dozen. It's a dozen archaeological sites. Uh, Karahan Pepe is included in that. I see. So where do you where do you want to take this research next? Well, I mean. There will always be more excavations, so there will always be more material. Um, so, you know, that, that is, every time there's something new that comes along, it's something to check against. Does this fit with what we know or think, or does it contradict it? So there's that aspect. Um, but as I mentioned right at the start, there is this gap in our sort of continuity, simply because I don't think anyone's looked at that time period. Um, so going from, let's say, the end of Chattelhoyuk, about 6,000 BC, through to the Bronze Age, or roughly 3,000 BC, there are lots of archaeological sites in Mesopotamia um, going all the way down um, those two rivers. There are lots of sites in that area in Syria. Uh, and so, you know, that we, uh, it'll be interesting to see what further correlations we find with the symbolism at these sites. To try and make that. that connection. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that if you if you can, that's going to be incredible. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, there's it's we'll it's see. hard to do that work because the area where these these civilization these settlements are is is not a particularly stable area for excavations and for exploration. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, there are there are. I think there is quite a lot of information, though. There are quite a few archaeological sites there already. Um, so it's not necessarily finding new information or, or new excavations. It's, it's really just carefully going through this abundance of data that already exists from a multitude of sites in that area, uh, which will take time. And as I say, I think it's an opportunity. Um, hopefully other people will, will um, see it as an opportunity. And we'll start looking at uh, some of this symbolism as potentially, you know, or at least some of it as astronomically uh, inspired. What's the next question that you plan to tackle, like directly after you've, uh, you said you're working on a paper right now, but after that, where do you go? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, a lot of it depends on what comes up, what the ex archaeologists excavate. Okay, so you're kind of waiting for the next. Um, Thing that's excavated. I mentioned 
trying to fill in that uh, temporal gap. But also, so, so the main, some of these, the triggers for the research have come from um, people just contacting me. And they say, in many cases, they'll say, have you seen this? And I go, well, I don't think that's uh, particularly significant. But it, it, very occasionally, someone will come up with something that I think is, is really significant. And so sometimes, uh, um, the paper on um, the lunar solar calendar, the, the key piece of information there, which was to see that these V symbols probably, or, or they could denote a lunar cycle, I suspect they do. That key piece, that key insight came from someone who contacted me completely out of the blue. Um, I, no, I don't know them. Uh, and uh, so we kind of then developed this idea, and it, again, it all, it all kind of worked. Very cool. How do uh, how do people find you if they they do have some brilliant insight that they uh, want to get in touch with you about? Or uh, uh, do, you, do you do social media? Or do you have a, a lab website, or or is your blog the best place? Um, probably Facebook, um, my blog, or just my my work email. <laughs> Could get overloaded. Excellent. I'll put, we'll put those in the description. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, if people are interested in following any of these ideas up, then my blog is a good place to start, martinsweatman.blogspot.com. Uh, so there I, I, I put down some of my ideas, but also that's where I tend to host the most recent um, version of a manuscript that's um, undergoing peer review. So if you want to see the very latest, then uh, it's on my blog. Excellent. Nice. Well, thank you for giving us your time today. This has been really interesting. A lot of things to puzzle over in the days to come. And uh, wow. yeah, I wish you I wish you luck with your your future projects. And yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. No, it's been a really it's been a really wide ranging and interesting discussion. Thank you. We do our best. All right. Have, have so a great much. rest of your day, sir.